Everybody's trying to steal my lady Spiders in the mirror and things can be right Back to the scene of a Friday night To a bless collision still frozen time Spill drinkers keep it in the sound of her first time And why did you argue? Dreaming of those eyes The best part of my life And when we make love, babe I would all make a sound The clock won't turn around It's a rainy day here, which is so wonderful and unusual. Welcome to the vlog, my friends. Hello, my friends. Welcome to a vlog. So this is something that I kind of just decided to do last minute. I decided to, so I decided to just do a full review of Persuasion, the book, and then I'm also going to watch the new Netflix adaptation, and then I'm gonna review that, and that's gonna be in one video. So. I have spent this entire week reading this book. It's very short, right? I've read this book before. I am not new to classic literature. I studied classics extensively in my early to mid 20s, maybe even late 20s. I just had a real big passion for the classics and I think that I started out being a little bit pretentious when I wanted to read them because I was like, I, you know, I just, I was a little bit of a, reader snob and I wanted to say that I had read all these classics and I studied them in college too but I quickly came to fall in love with them and Jane Austen was an author that I read in high school that I tried to read Pride and Prejudice I did read it I it just went over my head completely I wasn't really into it but then when I approached it later in my 20s I just fell in love with her books and so I read most of her books, the only book at this point that I haven't read is Emma, which I now kind of want to go back and do. I've read all of them up until right now. My favorite book of hers has always been Sense and Sensibility. I just absolutely love that story. It feels very hopeful while still having like a lot of angst and I love the sisters relationship and it just has always been my favorite book of hers. So when I originally read this when I was younger, in my 20s, I gave it four stars and I really enjoyed it, but I definitely feel like it didn't hit me the way that it hit me now when I read it. So I spent the week reading this and then I also have been listening to podcasts discussing it. I've been reading articles about it. So I have been entrenched in the world of persuasion and Jane Austen. And I just, I just feel so much love and appreciation and just sort of awe for this book. It just is kind of one of the best feelings ever. So I'm pretty sure most people know what the basic plot of this book is. It is essentially, it was written, Jane Austen, this was her last published book. It was published posthumously. This is the last book that she wrote. She passed away at 41. She wrote this book when she was 40, I believe, 40 or 41. And her brother actually is the one who published it after she had passed away. Some editions will have the foreword that he wrote in there stating that it was her last work and that there was no, the characters in here were not based on anyone in reality. They were always, you know, creations of her own mind. And I think that there are letters that Jane Austen has written to her niece, Fanny. I think her name is Fanny or Franny that prove that is completely incorrect. <laughs> they often talked about the characters that she wrote and how they had to do with real life people. So, but you know, her brother wanted to honor her memory and didn't want any tarnish to come upon her. He also is the one who titled this book. This is, this persuasion was not titled by Jane Austen. And I just think that's just so completely fascinating. So in the last years of Jane's life, she was very ill and she passed away to a mysterious illness that nobody really knows what it was. 
and many people have reflected on the idea that this book is largely Jane's actual story of a love in the bloom of youth that happened that was then lost. Only in Jane's case, it was never reclaimed. So this is sort of her own, that's what some people believe. This is Jane's love story with a happily ever after. And I also feel like there there is some evidence that may be true. Jane, we know Jane was engaged. And then we also know that she broke that engagement the very next day. We also know that Jane had a relationship of some sort with an Irishman. And we know that it was a pretty... Uh, pretty strong relationship because this man came to England for Jane's funeral when she passed away. But there's no documentation that says that actually was the romance, but I, I am going to believe that it is. So I think that this book is also so different from Jane's books, especially if you prefer her more. Uh, this book does have a bit of Jane's comedy, but it's very, very much more subtle, I feel like, than the comedy in Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility and probably Emma, which I feel like most people consider that to be a comedic genius work. I haven't read it largely for that reason. <laughs> but this book has bits of humor, but they are so, so subtle. And it's always a commentary on the side characters, specifically her family in here and Elliot's family. So it's basically a second chance romance. It would be considered a contemporary romance at the time when Jane wrote it. This would have been contemporary romance. A lot of people consider Jane Austen to be the historical romance writer, but they don't understand that she wrote contemporary fiction, contemporary romance. All of her books have a happily ever after. All of them focus on relationships and love and yeah, she was basically a contemporary romance writer. Now, again, she wrote with a lot of wit, a lot of cleverness, and a lot of subtlety. And a lot of the cues that you find in this book that show you Wentworth's actual feelings for Anne are extremely subtle. So much so that if you didn't know some of the social conventions at the time, you might miss it. So Anne Elliot, in the bloom of youth, 19, falls in love with a very young, naval officer. Her family, her father specifically, is in love with the idea of having a title. He feels that is just one's, like, he's a very vain man. It's, it's very obvious that he's a super vain man, loves the idea of a title, considers himself to be so much better than everyone else because of that title. And he really frowns upon Anne wanting to marry a naval officer, one, because he considers those naval officers to be so far below him. Even if, in the course of their careers, when they take over ships and accumulate some wealth, even though they have money, he will never respect them because they're made men, essentially, and not titled men. Now, Mrs. Russell, who was a friend of Jane, or of Anne's mother, persuades Anne to not marry Captain Wentworth because she's afraid that this long engagement, Wentworth will go to, to the Navy and he will die and then Anne will be left not only, you know, with no money, but also heartbroken because of that. So there are a lot of reasons that the people in her life don't want her to marry Wentworth, even though they are deeply, deeply in love. But the, the, one of the reasons this book is called Persuasion is because of how Anne is able to be persuaded to follow what her family wants her to do instead of what her heart wants her to do. And I think that it says a lot about the fact that Anne was very much afraid of giving up that desire to make sure that her family think well of her. Like, she didn't want to give up that. She wasn't able to give that up. She wanted to still make sure that her family and friends thought well of her and she was not ready to get rid of that. And that's one of the big themes of the book, I think, as we see her change that perspective over time to where at the end, that's no longer a concern of hers. Time passes from that beginning. Eight years pass. Eight and a half years, something like that. And now Anne and her family find themselves sort of, mostly her father, in dire financial straits. Her mother has passed away and her father has not made good financial decisions to the point where he finds himself in deep debt. So the only solution is for them to let their house, to basically rent their house and go and move to Bath where they would be able to have a smaller apartment and not give up the luxurious life that they are used to. 
but they don't want anybody to know that they're letting their house. They don't want anyone to know that they're in that type of position where somebody has to come and rent their house. So the people who rent their house are Admiral Croft and his wife, and Anne realizes that Admiral Croft's wife is Wentworth's sister. So she's a little terrified that Wentworth is going to show up at some time. She doesn't want to see him, she's sure that he's going to have some bad feelings towards her, and she's just kind of avoiding that at all costs. A lot of other things tend to happen to progress the plot and the movie forward. We find Wentworth does actually come into town and decides instead of going straight to Bath, she's going to go and visit her sister Mary, who is married to a man they have young children. And in the home where Mary is living and Anne is staying, the Charles, Mary's husband's parents, are also living in a house next door. So they're kind of like running back and forth between both households. And Charles' parents also has two daughters of marriageable age. So this is where we start to see a little bit of the the tension in the relationship come about. And in this relationship that isn't really a relationship, but there's feelings between Anne and Wentworth because he comes into town and these two young women sort of latch onto him. He's this accomplished, dashing, handsome naval officer and they're sort of smitten with him. And so he, he sort of courts them a little bit, flirts with them. And Anne this whole time is just looking at this so morosely, but of course believes that those feelings are dead, even on his side, even though hers are still very much there. Over the course of the book, we see these sort of social interactions back and forth, and we see things develop between Anne and a potential other suitor, her cousin, comes along, thinks that he's going to, or is going to try and marry her because he's sort of not a great guy and he wants to make sure that he gets the title because there's some rumors that Anne's father may actually make this other woman <laughs> his wife and uh, his mistress at the time. And if he does and has an heir, then this guy is out of the title and he really wants the title. There's a lot of other things going on there with that man. So. At that point, Wentworth believes that this man wants Anne, and we start to see little flares of jealousy there. Just very, very subtle, very, very subtle. You know, I always say that I am really interested in subtlety in my romances, and I feel like reading this this week was like, it was such a, such, such a huge, huge contrast in the subtle subtlety that I prefer in my modern day romances with what Jane is actually doing here. Everyone, if you read anything about persuasion, something that is often mentioned is Wentworth's umbrella and the significance of that. And that is one example of something that is so very subtle, but means so much. So at this time, umbrellas were sort of seen only something that ladies would use. Wentworth comes to Bath and he brings with him an umbrella. There's a specific scene earlier in the book when Anne is visiting the Crofts at her former home and she notices that they have like a stand of umbrellas right by the door and admiral croft says if you need an umbrella just grab one we don't you know we don't stand on ceremony i know when you lived here you kept them in a separate room you know and the servants went and got one and the significance there is that Anne's father wanted to make sure that umbrellas were not only seen to be as something only for ladies but they were also sort of seen as like why are you out walking in the rain instead of being in your carriage? Do you not have the funds? Are you not well off enough to not have to walk in the rain? So he wanted to make sure that if anybody was going to use an umbrella, Anne's father, they would have to go and ask a servant to get one to use it. So that was such an interesting little scene that really reads very insignificantly if you're just reading this just for the story and you don't have that context about umbrellas. But when you actually are reading this, you see there's a lot of significance to that umbrella. So there's a scene in the book where Anne is about to go walk out in the rain and Wentworth is there and he offers her his umbrella. And it's known, it's made known that he specifically came to Bath with an umbrella. And so because, you know, Wentworth is this powerful, masculine, strong naval officer who would never be afraid of a little rain. He was in the Navy, on the sea. He came to Bath with an umbrella. The subtext there is that, of course, he's going to be courting someone. Now, at this point, Anne believes that to be one of the two girls, the sisters. But at the end of the book, it's made very clear that Wentworth came to Bath with the express intention 
to court Anne. He wanted her back. He wanted to reconnect. So when you find all that out, his desire to protect her in the rain, his desire to care for her, his desire to make sure that she wouldn't get wet, like, it's so freaking romantic and I die over it. I literally die over that umbrella. Every, every, every time I hear any reference to Wentworth's umbrella, I'm like, they know. They know the significance of that. Wentworth is the epitome of a stoic hero. He is stoic. He is broody. He is cold. He never, ever, ever lets on to Anne that he actually still has feelings for her. She believes that he doesn't have feelings for her and that he is actually just angry with her. Now, I couldn't help but think about, again, The Magic by Lisa Kleypas, which is a persuasion retelling very loosely, but you get that same vibe from, again, The Magic when you see McKenna have that hostility towards Aline in that book, even though you know that they both still love each other so much. It was just, oh my gosh, it was so beautiful. I just died over it. I loved it so much. But if you're reading this just as a casual afternoon read, thinking you're getting a romance, I think you're going to be disappointed. And I don't think that I fully grasped the power of this book until I had reread it this week and did some research into some other things in the time. Even though I had studied this years ago, I was too young to know what it would feel like to have like love lost and then regained. I was too young to understand how difficult Anne's life circumstances were and how much sorrow she was bearing for realizing that she probably wasn't going to get married. Her The hope that she had in her youth, the hope that you read about in Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility, that lighthearted feeling isn't in this book. This book is much more melancholy because Anne has realized she made choices in her life. She not only broke her engagement with Captain Wentworth, she broke, she didn't make an engagement with anybody else. She turned them down. And so now she's surrounded by these family members who she finds ridiculous or, you know, some kind of annoying. She's in this relationship with Mrs. Russell, who really is sort of trying to resurrect her friendship with Anne's mother. And she's just filled with a lot of melancholy and sorrow. And I feel like reading this now, when I'm older, when I have more life experience, I can really appreciate everything that Anne was going through in this book. Okay, I'm going to end this here. I'm not done talking about it, but my battery's about to die. And then we'll talk more about this before we get into the Netflix adaptation. Okay, friends, I'm back. Both of the dogs are out. If you're new to the channel, if you somehow found me because of persuasion and you hear them, I apologize, but I have a puppy and a grown-up dog and that's all we've got here. So anyway, let's talk about the rest of persuasion. So specifically, the letter, okay? I feel like I'm really interested in hearing someone's experience reading this for the first time who is a romance reader who hasn't read Jane Austen before. So when I asked my friends to host a live show with me, I knew that Jen had read it before, but I didn't know if Jessen or Tiffany had read it. And so we haven't had the live show yet. That's happening tonight. And I am so interested to hear what they think about it because every single podcast, commentary, article, not every single one, but most of them that I've read or listened to discussion about this book are from people who typically side-eye the romance genre. And they're like, I'm not really a fan of rom-coms. I'm not really a fan of romance. And, and yet they love Jane Austen. And I think that there's, I mean, obviously we have Jane Austen. She's a classic author. And even men will read this and break it down and critique it and discuss it. And they would never dream of doing that with a modern romance book. And I think it's interesting because there are authors who are writing today who are making the same impact on our world, on our minds right now that Jane Austen made in her time. And yet people in the literary world will still look down on them because they're under the blanket of romance. I just was reading, well, what made me want to do a read along for this and talk about it is that I had seen a Twitter thread. Let me see if I can find her name because it was it was fantastic, this Twitter thread. It's by Kate Eland on Twitter. And she is a romance writer, romance reader, not writer. And she had this excellent thread all about the history of Jane Austen and how she was at the end of her life, largely hope had gone, and talking about the melancholy tone of persuasion and also the character of Anne Elliot and how this book, while could arguably be Jane Austen's best work. And the thing that makes it so sad, I know I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, is that this, <laughs> this was her final book. 
And it represents a distinctive shift in her style, in her artistic work. And she passed away shortly after she finished this, and I can't help but wonder what else she might have written if it was continuing in this vein. What would she have written, you know, a few years from then, after she had finished this book? Because you can tell that she still wants there to be a happily ever after. She's still searching. She wants that, that happy ending. But most of this book, even though you have comedic breaks and you have some swoony moments, most of the swoon comes at the end of the book, for sure, in the letter. <laughs> like, it, that's pretty much the only arguably swoony thing in here for a modern reader, other than the umbrella scene, which we already talked about. But I think that this book shows such a different side of Jane Austen, where it's really showing more real, more of a realistic worldview that Jane had at that time after, you know, she was living in poverty, she was depending on her brother to take care of her. Her hope for love had passed away, you know, had pretty much gone. She wasn't well, she was ill, you know, she had supposedly, like we talked about earlier, had a lost love and never married. So most of her hopes for her future were very, very dim. And there actually something else that's interesting about this is that the original ending pers for Persuasion is not what you get in the final version. She rewrote that ending. She wasn't happy with it. I think the original ending had less of a like a fan fantasy happily ever after, whereas this one feels like such a satisfying happily ever after, even for a modern romance reader. And I just feel like there's so much about this book that can really appeal to a romance reader. And that's what I'm talking to because this is a romance book reviewing channel. <laughs> but also just to people in general. So my main concern from the beginning when I saw the trailer for the Netflix Persuasion is that they were go not going to capture that melancholy vibe, that melancholy tone, that feeling of almost like a lost hope and Anne's specific character who is a little bit brittle. She's a little bit difficult to like. She's prickly. She's not a Elizabeth Bennet heroine, you know, she's not Emma. She's not Marianne. She's she's a woman who has had disappointment and lost hope, kind of. And she's she's dealing with her reality and the rose colored glasses have come off of her, you know? And I think that that makes her less likable than the other books, but I also feel like that makes her a little more relatable, and I feel like that makes her happily ever after so much more satisfying. <sighs> I just love this book so much. So I gave it five stars. I think it's fantastic, and truly the more that I think about this, even, even last night before I really got thinking about what I wanted to say in this video, even last night, I would have to do a reread of all of Austen's work, but even last night I was still holding Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, and then Persuasion. That's how it's always been for me. I've always loved them in that order, and then the other ones kind of fall wherever. But now, having had the time, like, I took the whole week to not feel pressure to read other books, to not try and read it quickly, but to really think about it as I read it, to try and engage with it critically and not just on a surface level because I think that the, the the enjoyment that you can get from persuasion is not a surface level except for the letter which is achingly deepingly beautifully romantic and is probably the most quoted romantic letter in the history of fiction but the rest of the book can feel a little slow it can feel a little bit of a slog it can feel like it's not paced right but I think that if you look at it from what is she trying to tell with each of these interactions with these characters, you can really see that everything that she's telling you, every scene, every interaction, is leading to you to understand Anne's character better and to get you to the point where you believe their happily ever after actually worked out perfectly. So the letter that Wentworth writes, that final, that, not final scene, but that scene where Anne is having the conversation with the other captain and they're arguing about the sexes and which one sort of holds on to love longer when love is lost. Wentworth cannot bear to hear her say that women hold on to love longer. They're, they're less likely to move on. So he writes her a letter, slides it to her, 
and leaves. And she reads it and is overcome with emotion because it's his declaration of love to her. You know, like, you pierce my soul. I am half agony, half hope. Like, all of his intentions for coming to Bath are clear in that letter. And it's so freaking beautiful. I love it so much. So I, I adored this book. I think that it is so rich. And it really, this book, I feel like, really lets you appreciate Jane Austen as a person as a person and as an author and it was just fantastic so now that I am deeply deeply in love with this and you have heard all of my feelings condensed to probably like 25 minutes I'm not sure how long these clips are I know that's not condensed if you've listened this long you're a real one now I'm going to go and watch the Netflix adaptation and I'm very very nervous about it I, 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 I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm going to like it, to be quite honest, but I'm still going to watch it. That was the whole point of this. And I'm going to try, I'm going to try and separate what this book means to me and the way that I feel about this from just an adaptation of persuasion, you know, like, I think that I'm going to have to think about it as this is just an adaptation, so I don't feel ragey because... I mean, the, the trailers that I've seen where Anne is being very cheeky, very humorous, very lighthearted, like, I don't know how they're going to make that convincing to me that these two have had this pining for each other for so long and they miscommunicate. They won't communicate. It's not even miscommunication. They won't communicate until he writes her that letter because they're so afraid specifically Wentworth is so afraid that he's going to be rebuffed, that she doesn't have those feelings for him, and and she believes him to be angry at her and to be cold at her, and like, ugh, how how is that going to come across? Okay, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch it now. And I'm not scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. But we're going to watch it, and then I'll review that. Okay, so I started it. I'm only like seven or eight minutes in, and I'm not going to give you like a play-by-play -play as I watch it, but I wanted to give you my first impressions as they're fresh, because this is just hitting me. It feels like they, I mean, and, and they have to, they don't have to, but I know this is, this is what makes adaptations work that are based on like classics is that they, they strip the subtlety from it so that it's more accessible for all audiences to watch it. So that's the thing that I'm noticing right off the bat is that it's very like all the subtlety is gone it's very on the nose it's telling you everything that that jane just does through subtext and through very little details so i expected that but it's still like to me it feels stronger than i expected it to but i don't know i i think that's something that makes the bbc adaptations work so well is that they they don't do that they don't like almost like americanize it you know like they don't I don't want to say dumb it down, but they they leave a lot of that subtlety and nuance in there, whereas I feel like this is a little heavy-handed with telling you exactly right off the bat what happened with Jane and Wentworth, why she, you know, declined him, and very explicitly giving you details about how vain her dad is, how her sister doesn't really like her, they don't really like Jane, and the scene when the debt collectors come in. Yeah, it's it's a little too on the nose for me. Anything that is too on the nose, anything that is too in your face, I have a hard time with because I find it to be boring. So that's a little frustrating, but I do think it's beautifully filmed. <laughs> so, okay. I don't know when I'll be back, but I'm going to keep watching. Hello, my friends. Well, hello. I got all fancy because we are going to a wedding and I just barely finished Netflix Persuasion and I wanted to come and talk about it before we go and before the live show tonight. <laughs> so if you have seen, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, there's spoilers throughout this whole video. If it's, there's going to be spoilers, I'm sorry I didn't warn you ahead of time, but I, if you... <laughs> If you know me and you listened to what I had to say about my feelings about Persuasion, the novel, then you are not going to be surprised to know that I absolutely hated the Netflix adaptation. I hated it. Look, I feel like in general, in general, I can separate my feelings for a book or like I don't need an adaptation to be exact. I don't for sure. Like I, 
I actually loved as a you know as a young younger person I loved both City of Bones and the Vampire Academy and I thought those movies were kind of terrible but I still enjoyed them because like I don't know I was able to separate those two and like I know that's something that's completely different but the attachment that I have for Jane Austen is huge like a lot of people and I was very disappointed with this movie. I give it a two out of five stars, honestly. I think that if I if I had never read a Jane Austen book, that's not even true. If if I did not know what I know about persuasion, if I didn't know the history of Jane as she was writing that book, the history of her life, if I didn't feel like the huge tonal shift in that book compared to her previous books, would I have been able to just enjoy this as a period movie? Maybe. But even then, it's doubtful because it's just, it feels like this movie felt like it was trying really hard to be quirky and funny, very much like the new Emma, but also sort of keeping that broody romance, that angsty romance still thriving, and it just failed. It failed big time. The, there was no real angst in this book, right? There was no, the thing that, something that really bothered me is you never really had a grasp of how devastating it was for Anne to break off the engagement and to pine for Frederick for all of those years, you know? You never really understood the gravity of her choice. You never really understood how she was persuaded other than like the heavy handed telling you. I didn't like the tone of this movie at all, and that was the thing I was most afraid of, but I just feel like I can't enjoy a movie based on persuasion that doesn't feel like persuasion. Like, it doesn't have to have every single detail. It didn't even have Wentworth's umbrella, okay? And like, I wasn't mad about that. I mean, that that's like so far down on what they could have included. I would have loved to see it, but they just completely missed the tone of this book. They completely missed the angst and the longing and the complicated emotions that Anne goes through in the book as she's really struggling with regret and trying to still live her life without just letting that despair kind of mire her. And she's such a stalwart character, like she is still very loving and still very kind and very, you know, motherly to her sister's boys, and that is completely there in the movie, in the Netflix adaptation, but the part, the struggle, the internal struggle of her to balance that with like this feeling of grief for saying goodbye to her one long lost love, her soulmate, you know, like that regret weighs on her the whole book. And not only the regret of losing that love, but the, this feeling of hopelessness that her chances are now gone, you know? And I don't know. It was the the tone was a huge miss. Like that's like that's like a huge dock for me. I just can't really get past that, honestly. However, there were other issues and probably the other one that was very very big, very glaring to me. Again, like most of the things I'm talking about are how the movie feels to me. And something that really irritated me is how they got they totally eliminated any subtlety. There was zero subtlety. And that's something that I just also recently watched the 2008 BBC Persuasion, which I adored. It was fantastic. If you want a great movie adaptation and you haven't seen that yet, please watch it because it's so good. Like the angst in that, the longing, the despair. Oh my gosh, it's so good. I'm sure you already know about it, but if you haven't, if this is your introduction to Persuasion, like put Netflix in the garbage and go watch that one because it's so much better and it just really captures all of the feelings that I wanted it to, you know? So, uh, but getting rid of that subtlety and what they did instead was they broke the fourth wall, which I knew they were going to do with Anne and it just felt so ridiculous. It just felt so ridiculous. It felt like even when she reads the letter, when Wentworth gives her the letter and she's reading it, she's reading it as if she's reading it to a friend. She's reading it to the camera. And I just can't even tell you how much I despise that. That was like the pinnacle moment I wanted included in this movie. And it was ruined because it seemed very, it, it lost that lack of intimacy that having that letter that you know was hard for him to give to her. To have, to act like she was sharing it with someone just felt very reductive to what that act actually meant, that letter actually meant. 
And I just didn't love that. Like, I would have loved it so much more if it had, she had just been reading it and his voice had been, like, reading it to her in her head. That would have been perfection. And they did do that. But the way that it started out was just, like, ugh, it was so disappointing. That, that letter scene. Everybody knows about that letter scene. People know about what's in that letter scene who haven't ever read the books because those quotes are just iconic and deeply romantic and just, ugh. It's my favorite part of the book. It's most people's favorite part of the book. And they uh, really screwed the pooch on that. It was terrible. I, I was very disappointed with that. So, and also getting rid of the subtlety, they do that with, they tell you too much by breaking the fourth wall. She literally explains everything to you. And this was such a simple story, simple retelling. There was no, like, no subtlety, no nuance. There wasn't any details that you would need to know any historical background for, anything about Jane Austen. So I don't even understand why they had her break the fourth wall and explain everything to you when it wasn't hard to put the context clues together. But also, like, even with her cousin, Mr. Elliot, like, instead of Anne figuring that out through her, you know, schoolmate friend, he just literally tells her that I do want to marry you because uh, I'm worried about this lady that your father is, you know, maybe going to have an heir with, maybe want to marry. And so I'm just that, just, that just removed that element of, is she actually interested in this guy? Could she want to marry him? Because it, it just like, it took every, all of that mystery away. Any, any like draw that you might have felt towards him, it just was like, if you didn't know the story, right? If you were just watching the show, it just minimized that and made it just like a useless plot device that really did nothing other than that one scene, which was a good scene, by the way, when Mr. Elliot sees Anne for the first time when they're walking uh, off by the sea and Captain Wentworth is like gets all up in his face and is like what are you doing what are your intentions like that was beautiful I loved that so much those are the things that I want to see like if you're gonna make changes to this beautiful book make them more romantic more obvious in that way don't make them more obvious in the story of the family or their financial situation or plot devices like I don't need that to be obvious I don't need that to be obvious if you're gonna simplify things simplify that but give me more obvious romantic gestures. And I don't know, I felt like there were, there, there were a few, like the, the opening scene when you see Captain Wentworth and Anne and they're like embracing on the grass, like that was beautifully romantic. And I had high hopes for just like a second and they were quickly dashed. But then you got a little bit of that at the end, which was also really beautiful. But I just wish that the tone that you felt there had been connected more fully because it just felt like, is it trying to be a comedy? Is it, it's trying to be quirky. It's trying to be funny. It wasn't very romantic at all. I did like the actor who played Wentworth though. I think he did a great job. Um, he's still not as good as the BBC <laughs> version of Wentworth, but I absolutely despised Anne. And it has nothing to do with who that actress is or anything about that actress it, other than her, the way that she portrayed this role that was w written for her. But probably my main gripe with it isn't really in the actress's performance so much as it is how they wrote her to be, because that, that is not my Anne Elliot at all. Not at all. I feel like the BBC version of Anne is even a little bit too soft than she is compared in the book. And I, I wanted her to be a little bit more bristly, but that's a much closer version of what I envision Anne to be than this Netflix Anne. Like, this Netflix Anne is not even on the same planet as Anne Elliot. Like, not even close, no similarities whatsoever. <sighs> I'm so disappointed, honestly. Like, I, I don't think I have been this disappointed in a book to movie adaptation in a really long time. Like, I have reviews for the two Bridgerton Netflix um, adaptations, and also for the Shadow and Bone, and I enjoyed all of those, even though they were much different, and I'm very attached to, I really love the Viscount Who Loved Me book, I love the Bridgerton books, they, they aren't books that were like formative to my reading years as much as like Jane Austen was, but I deeply love uh, the Six of Crows series by Lee Bardugo, and I felt like that was a really great adaptation, even though it had changes, because it captured the feeling that the book gave me. And this adaptation, this Netflix adaptation, was like, there was nothing, there was, there was hardly anything that captured the feeling that you get when you're reading that book. Like, the heartbreak, and the longing, and that feeling like, I, I made the worst decision of my life. I want to be with him, but he seems to despise me. Like, that 
the actor, Wentworth, did a pretty good job of convincing her that he wasn't, you know, that he had cold feelings towards her. But Anne acted so often, like, she she didn't even really care. Like, I just didn't even understand. Oh, gosh, I hated her so much. I hated, I hated the way they wrote Anne in this. That... That is really what this all boils down to me. If I have to say what I dislike about this the most, it's that they removed any subtlety or wit that Jane Austen had in the book. Subtlety of feelings, like there were really very few glances or gestures that conveyed emotion. They told you way too much. Breaking the fourth wall was unnecessary and honestly stupid. And they, even when she wasn't telling you directly what was happening, a character would tell you what happened. So it felt very reductive in that way, and it also felt a little bit insulting. Like, I I know that this should appeal to a wide audience, but that that alone, those two things, I feel like eliminates a huge portion of people who really love Austen, because it was just ridiculous and stupid and a little bit insulting, to be quite honest. And then uh, also, I just... I just the the actress I did not like the actress at all there was no subtlety there was very very few moments where I could feel the romance it just like disappointed disappointed but not surprised sadly I I feel like the trailer I did watch the trailer as soon as it was announced I was super excited and I feel like the trailer tells you exactly what you're getting and it delivered on that, you know? So I'm not surprised that it headed in this direction, but I am still disappointed because this is not my version of persuasion. This is not what I feel like most people who read and love this book are going to want to see like at all. It's just, it almost feels like a mockery. Like I can't even believe that they would choose this heartbreaking and beautiful story that does have a happily ever after and kind of turn it into something that just felt like it's trying to be Emma 2.0 like it's not even the same story and I know like I said earlier I haven't read Emma but I know the story and now I want to I don't know if I want to read Emma I don't know but I'm sad it wasn't good but on the bright side the book was beautiful. I gained new insights. I changed my rating from a four star to a five star. This is probably, probably way up. Th this may be my new Austin favorite book. Now I really want to reread the others so I can rank them. <laughs> and uh, disappointed in the Netflix show. Two out of five stars. Very little to like about this. Didn't even really love the cinematography. I mean, Anne's outfits were beautiful, but who freaking cares if the rest of it is such a disaster, you know? Did like Wentworth. He was good. Um, I did like the diversity of the cast, too. I loved that. That was really, really great and beautiful. But the tone of the, this was just such a, such a disappointment. Such a disappointment. So, yeah, I cannot recommend this. I mean, watch it if you're curious, but you'll pro if you love Persuasion, you're probably going to be angry like me. I don't know. Maybe you won't. Maybe you love Persuasion and you were able to get past what bothered me about it and you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd love to know about that. Um, but yeah, the BBC Persuasion is 10 out of 10. Fantastic, fantastic adaptation. And of course it is though, right? Like there were no doubts. So anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, I hope you enjoyed hearing my thoughts about the book and the movie. And uh, yeah, let me know if you have read or watched the Netflix adaptation and what your opinion is, because I would love to know. And I'll see y'all in my next video. If you're new here and you love romance novels or talking about books, uh, please be sure to like and subscribe.